very important. Okay, go ahead. Testing, testing, testing. Sounds good. Okay. Testing, testing. Okay. Well, let me know when we're live. Oh. Good afternoon, Woodland Pond. Today is Monday, July 20th, and it is my pleasure to present to you Raina Maisel, who moved into Woodland Pond about a year ago. Uh, I'm sorry, she moved in in January 2019 to the North Wing. And uh, you may have seen her in a, some of the productions of the Play Readers and perhaps other venues as well. So welcome, Raina, and I'm going to turn oh, it you. over to you. Okay. Uh, tell us now. We know that you were born in England, and That's let's right. take it from there. Okay. Well, <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, I was certainly born in England. I was raised in England. I went. To, I was educated in England, the whole nine yards, uh, and then uh, can eventually. Can you just speak a little louder? Eventually, I uh, graduated. Uh, I became, I was a lawyer, I was a, what they call a barrister, which is the uh, kind of lawyer in England that gets up and argues in the courts, because <laughs> I like arguing. And, <laughs> and uh, then uh, I met my husband. Uh, he was a physicist. And uh, in those days, uh, there was something called the brain drain. And I'm talking about 1956. He was offered a, uh, we got married. Uh, and uh, he was offered a job in the States uh, at three times what he could get yeah. in England. If so, I'm uh, not mistaken, uh, once Russia launched the Sputnik, Sputnik that's uh, the United States realized it had a lot of catching up to do. That's right. So they recruited your husband and other scientists from around the world. Yeah, what happened was they let out uh, contracts for research to any corporation that was willing to take it on. And there was a shortage of physicists in this country. So we, they sent, uh, the different firms uh, sent people out across Europe, actually, uh, to look for scientists who, particularly physicists, who could come over and uh, work on whatever was needed to be worked on. And my husband got an offer from Philco Corporation and so we came to Philadelphia, and mm -hmm. that's where we stayed for several years, uh, and he worked at Philco. Uh, he was actually, uh, his field was in spectroscopy, which is something to do with eyes and vision and uh, uh, actually the computation of distances in, in space. But of course, what they brought him over here for and had him do was nothing to do with that. It was... Uh, to do with research uh, on thin films. Uh, and he actually uh, became quite an expert in that film, wrote the uh, major book on it, uh, which I still have a few copies. Uh, but anyway, we, we, uh, we settled in uh, Philadelphia for a few years. And then IBM, uh, as you many of you probably know, went around looking for people to work here in, in uh, Poughkeepsie. And so uh, he got an offer from IBM, which he couldn't refuse. And so we came to Poughkeepsie in 19, I think, uh, 1968, somewhere around there. Oh, yeah, long time ago. Long, long time, time ago, ago. Yeah. yeah. So his, um, his career and his talents were, people sought him out, and yes. he, he yes, was rewarded did. for it. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So you lived in Wappingers for how long? Yeah, well, we first lived in LaGrange for about oh, 10 okay. years, and then we built a house in Wappingers, and uh, we lived there for 50 years. 50 years. A long time. A long time. Yeah. Saw a lot of changes, uh, including yeah. with IBM, right? Well, yes, uh, but when IBM uh, really went out of, out of the, the research or the development business, more accurately, um, he uh, started writing patents. <laughs> Uh, which uh, for which he happened to have, he had a, a very inventive mind and he had developed a lot of patents and there was someone uh, who had was ex IBM who had got a uh, contract with people uh, over in um, uh, where was it the 
near Japan, somewhere out there. Mm -hmm. And they they uh, came and he needed people to work. And uh, my husband was one of the people who wrote patents for him. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, getting back to your law career in England, it wasn't easy to be one of the female well, lawyers, was it? Well, let me put it this way. In uh, England at that time, I can't say there was uh, a tremendous uh, welcoming of women in the law, but it wasn't quite as uh, traumatic as it seems to have been over here. I mean, for example, in my class uh, in college, there were 17 women out of 100 men. Mm. And when we graduated, I think with the total number that graduated was 70, because over there, if you fail, they throw you out. They don't let you keep coming back and try again. Oh, yeah. so, no, no six-year plan or 10-year plan. You you're, you're, know, you're out. And when we, I know when the class graduated, I don't remember the numbers, but I know there were 70 of us less and it was the same proportion of women. Mm. Yeah, so. I went to a college that wasn't supposed to be all male, but it was all male. There were about 120 yeah. fellows and about 14 girls. So it's, yeah. uh, but the, it, it was friendly. There, there yeah. wasn't yeah. Any, okay. any discrimination that I picked up then. Okay, now um, you had you have two children here. Yes, mm -hmm. I have. Well, <clears throat> I have a son who's on Long Island. Don't ask me what he does, but it has to do with computers. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a daughter who's uh, she's a uh, well, she's a physician basically, but she does administration. And right now she's down in Florida. Oh, oh, yes, oh. <laughs> Oh, one she's of the a chief, spots. chief uh, not, not just a chief medical officer, but she's a president of something or other. I don't know. I don't uh, follow it exactly. They're having, I probably uh, got it wrong if I did say it. No, they're going through now what we went through in March. Yes, they're having a very hard time. Yeah. Um, now, you, I think you mentioned that uh, when you were living in Wappingers, you after your children were out of the house, you decided to sit for the bar. Yes, that? yes, I did that in, uh, yes, what, what normally what you have to do here, as those of you who are lawyers know, you have to go to law school and then you have to take uh, the bar exams. Well, because I had been to one of the law schools in England that they recognize, um, I didn't have to go to law school. Uh, I just had to uh, sit the bar exams. So what I did was I looked for the cram courses that they give for law students who uh, finish their law degree uh, and then have to sit the bar. And there were several of them down at Dobbs Ferry and up in Kingston. And I took about three of them, I think. And then I sat the bar exam here and I passed. Hmm. Yeah. What so. was, was it challenging the difference in the law between what you studied in England and here? You know, that's a good question. The, um, the law here, at least I'm talking about New York State, I'm not talking about anywhere else. In New York State, it's based upon English law as it was in, what, 1776? Mm. But it's been a little change, a few <laughs> changes since then. So it wasn't unfamiliar, um, but uh, you know, they were, I had to study for it. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I took the cram courses. Good for you. I had a couple of friends who sat for the bar and failed it twice. Yes, yes. It's a very difficult test. Yes, it was. Uh, so. One of the years, um, it was given in the ship passenger terminal on the west side of Manhattan, oh, yeah. and there was no air conditioning. <laughs> and a lot of them appealed the decision if they failed, sure. that the conditions were such that it wasn't an equal playing field with someone sitting in an air-conditioned office. Sure. So I think it was upheld. <laughs> okay, now what type of law did you practice here in, in New York? Well, in New York, you know, I was- uh, A little a little louder. Yeah, I was in New York, okay, and uh, the law here, 
there was a lot of room for representing uh, when you just started and you didn't have connections, uh, there was a lot of room for representing uh, primarily women who had got separated from their husbands or wanted to be separated from their husbands uh, and needed representation at a, a, they couldn't afford fees. So I started off by taking those, those kind of cases. And so I ended up developing a practice that was primarily in what we call family law. Um, and then uh, after a few years, uh, and my kids were out of the house, and I actually had an office in my house, um, and people would come. It was amazing. You just gave directions and people came. And then uh, when my kids went off to college, then I became, uh, I worked for a firm called Gallup and Cutler in Poughkeepsie, and I was there for quite a long time. I can't remember, about seven, 11, 17 years, something like that. Oh. <laughs> and then I decided when I got to about, uh, at some point, I don't think I was 68, I said, that's enough of this. I'm not really making enough money to be worth it. And so I quit <laughs> and I retired and uh, here I am. And so we, we enjoyed, uh, my husband and I, at that point, he, he was, you know, he was out of IBM. Uh, and working on his own time. So then we just travel. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. I think you said one of the places you went to was Easter Island? Yes. Oh. Yeah. That, was a, that was a very interesting trip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So all those statues that you see, all those pictures. Yeah. yeah, they're having trouble with conservation of the statues there. Are they really? Yeah. yeah. The erosion. Yes. Is yes, but we, we, we actually went to the area on the island where they cut the statues out of the rock and oh. the quarry. And there's still statues that are partly made there. And uh, yeah, you can scramble down the cliff. Those days I could scramble down the cliff. I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there was a question of how the statues got from the quarry uh, down to their position, which is as you may know, it uh, is right on the shore and it overlooks, it turns face into the, uh, the, the, uh, the island. And the local people had the legend that the, the statues walked. And uh, we were fortunate enough, because I did this, I think, on an elder, we did this on an elder hostel oh. group. And the person who took us around was the chief person on that island. And he said that they, and there was, showed us movies because people kept trying to guess how these statues got there. And what they figured out was, in fact, they had a whole system whereby they moved them from side to side hmm. to get them down from the quarry down to where they stood on the shore. Side to side. Oh, yeah. So the walk. Interesting. No ropes or anything that in theory well, was. Side you know, there's to side. all kinds of theories yeah. as to how that. How was done. Oh, that was a good trip. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Raina, since you've been at Woodland Pond, um, what type of activities have you joined? Be you know, I mean, it was a short window before the <laughs> shutdown. Well, it was, I think, the, the basic, the main one was the pay readers group. Uh, were you uh, a secret actress? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> uh, of course, but when aren't most young girls, but. Uh, Yes, I was. In fact, I, what I really wanted to do when I was, uh, I mean, I was, you know, in school plays and I was in all the local plays. And when I wanted to go to college, what I wanted to do was to go to drama school. But I had very, uh, perhaps, sensible parents. And they said, no, 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 that's not a good life. You'd be traipsing around from one little town to another, you know, to put on little shows and what, mm. no, 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 that's not what you're going to do. So, uh, well, I thought, uh, the next best thing is law because <laughs> you have to get up and talk. <laughs> well, that's true. It is a performance. So, yes, yeah. it's a performance. So I, that's what I did. Oh, okay. Uh, did you have a chance to join any other groups here before the shutdown? Uh, just to play. That was yeah. basically the one. It was, a, it was yeah. a short, short window. Yeah. yeah. Now you've got a box on the table, and yeah. you've got something on the shopping. Card yeah, that I think yeah. our audience would really like to see. <laughs> okay, this is the wig that barristers wear, and I thought I'd just bring it, show you. When it starts out, it's I don't know if you can see it, 
but when it starts out, they're beautiful white. It's made of horsehair. And the people who make it are Ravenscroft, wick and robe makers in Lincoln's Inn in London. They have a monopoly on this stuff. And when you graduate, when you, when you get called to the bar, uh, and then you, oh, by the way, to, to become a member of the bar, you have to join one of the inns of court. You have to join Middle Temple, Inner Temple, Gray's, Lincoln's Inns, four of them. And then you, <laughs> it's a reminiscence of the, or leftover from the old times when uh, the law was administered by the, uh, the king through his officers who went around the different parts of England and held assizes. And so uh, you, um, what was I saying? Yeah, so you, you, you go and you have to be a member of one of the inns of court. And then you have to eat dinners because that's what they used to do. After they'd finished riding around, they got together and ate dinner together. So you have to join an inn of court and you have to eat so many dinners uh, over a period of, I oh. think, three years. I think it was, uh, if I recall, if you weren't going to law school, you had to eat 12 dinners a term. And I think there were four, four terms a year. And if you did go to law school, they shortened it. You only had to eat three dinners. So you would go to your inn of court and you would put on a robe. And they had a special robe room, uh, even in my time for the ladies. Uh, and you got dressed and you had to wear... Um, had to be dark. You had to have uh, you had to have your sleeves. Uh, you had to have long sleeves, and it had to come down below your knees. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't have anything really sexy there, obviously. <laughs> did you, did they talk during dinner about issues of law? Well, there wasn't any limitation on what you should talk about, but you were divided into what they call messes, four people, and you could only talk to the people in your mess, the four of you. Uh -huh. And if you talk to anybody outside, the fine was a bottle of wine. <laughs> that you had to provide. Yeah, that yeah. you had to provide. I don't ever remember anybody doing that. But yes, that was a fine. I mean, this is medieval stuff. It's very, 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 very weird. Rigid. I mean, this is, this is the okay, wing. I'll show see. you the wing. See? Like this. Oh, yes. Yeah. Is it still worn today by the barristers? As far as I know. And then below that, you have bands like clergymen wear. Like this fine or not, very, very usually, usually oh, yes. white, right? I can just and see Ruth Bader Ginsburg in that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have a robe, and that's just an ordinary robe, you know, like any if any robe that's a robe, you know, the, the, the oh. regular black robes so that I think judges here, I know judges here still wear robes. Yes, yes, no. yes. So oh, robe. thank you. That's really interesting. <laughs> it must have been hot being horsehair. Well, no, actually not. It's uh, it's open weave. See it? The weave is quite open. Oh, know. okay. Right inside. Wigs. And then you sat in the part of the court that was lower down. There was a bar, as they say, for the barristers. And you sat close to the, the judges because all the almost, well, they're doing more written stuff now, but the basic thing you had to do was argue. And you stood at the bar and you presented your case and you took your books and you took your books and you opened them and you read the cases. You did have to do some written work. Because oh. now I think it's all changed. I think they do just like here. Everybody writes, writes and writes and writes and writes. All of these. Does um, any case that you argued stand out to you? No. No. <laughs> just a blur. It's just a blur <laughs> after this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you didn't do uh, criminal work. I think, well, yes, I did back then. You know. Oh, yeah. But, but you know, uh, he was drunk, my lord, you know. <laughs> it was what? You would say to the court, you know, you would, you would get these prisoners who were brought up and they just needed someone to represent them. And the most common excuse you could make was, he was drunk, my lord, and didn't know what he was doing. I oh. remember that one. Oh, <laughs> that was a catch-all. <laughs> So let's see. Um, anything else you'd like to well, share I, with the residents when here? I came, yeah, when I came over, when I was living, we lived in, in uh, Poughkeepsie now for what, 50 years or so. Please and talk then, closer to the mic, right? right yeah, right uh, as I say, we were living in Poughkeepsie for many years, and I've got an article here someone wrote up, and I was very active in the local associations, uh, county players, 
AUW, Jewish Community Center, Jewish Welfare Board. I was president of the Marywood Civic Association. We tried to stop South Hills Mall coming in because it didn't work. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, and then I went back to, to do law, more or less. And then I was in um, the Center for Lifetime Studies. I was very active in that. Um, That's the one I, in uh, Marist? Is that yes, the yes, they're, yes they, they were. Eventually, we ended up at Locust Grove. Oh, uh, Locust Grove. Yeah, yes, sometimes when we first started, there were meetings at Vassar College. Oh. But, you know, then we went looking for a, for a house because the group grew. I mean, it grew from what, about 100 or so up to about 700. Uh, when, when I left, there were, we limited it pretty much to about 700, and just 700, and then it's gradually crept up. But of course, there's no more meetings at Locust Grove because everything. No. This virus is all shut no. down. No, someone here teaches yeah. um, uh, at Marist, and and it went online. It's a limited yes. amount online. Yes, I think I think they're having a lot of their on the program. I think it's all online now. Mm. Yeah. So, our LLI here, yes. I'm yeah. told, will be not happening this fall. Right. Right. Well. You know, it's <laughs> we have problems. We don't know. We yeah. don't know. Yeah. We don't know. No, I, I've heard from the CLS that they're having vir virtual yeah. uh, things, but I'm not sure. I have to figure out how to use Zoom and then oh, before yeah. I can get to it. Yeah. Zoom is a mixed bag. Some people <laughs> love it. Some people hate yeah. it. Yeah. Um, do you still have relatives in England? Very few now. I mm -hmm. mean, the, um, the ones I knew of who are older than me, they're not there. No. Um, and I have, what do I have? I have a, have a couple of cousins, yes, I do. Uh -huh. uh, and they used to come over. And I, of course, I used to go over there. Yeah. Um, so uh, were you surprised to find two other Brits here when really. you got here? No. Not really. <laughs> yeah. um, June and Jillian, right. both born in England. Yes, correct. Oh. Well, that... That is an interesting journey that you've shared with us. And we're glad you're here. We just hope that for all of our sake, we'll open up soon. Absolutely. And we certainly do. resume our wonderful activities. So yeah. thank you, Raina. Thank, thank you, you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Let me tell Lisa. Okay.